Welcome everybody uh, to Love Data Week. This is the event organized by the uh, local Basel node of the Swiss Reproducibility Network. Uh, the main organizers of this event are uh, Xeni De Migliani, Tuba, Tinci Antonoli, Noemi Capdevilla, uh, Claudia Weidenstein, and uh, myself. Uh, I am uh, Francesco Santini. I am a, a research uh, group leader here at the University of Basel in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And today uh, we are joined by Dr. Konstantin Luka, uh, who is the head of the data science team at the Clinical Data Center of the Department of Clinical Research at the University of Basel and the uh, University Hospital of Basel. Uh, since 2016, he has been involved in the data management and analysis of clinical trials, register and course studies with an emphasis on data integration and cleaning, reproducible data pipelines, uh, centralized data monitoring, randomization algorithms, and exploratory data analysis. He's a member of the Swiss Clinical Trial Organization's Data Management Platform and of the Research Data Management Network and Data Steward Program of the University of Basel. He serves in the University Hospital Basel Data Governance Board and has uh, shared his knowledge on data sharing, fair data management, and anonymization through teaching in the University of Basel Certificate of Advanced Studies Program in Clinical Trial Management. Uh, as uh, education, Konstantin studied theoretical and mathematical physics in Innsbruck and Munich and obtained his PhD at the University of Basel, conducting research in the field of elementary particle physics. He completed a master in advanced studies in data science uh, uh, in Zurich. Um, we are very happy to have Konstantin. Uh, just uh, uh, some housekeeping. Uh, uh, if you have questions during the presentation, please write them in the chat, the presentation is recorded. Uh, and uh, during the presentation, I advise that uh, uh, we keep our cameras off to avoid the problems with the recording. But afterwards, we can uh, turn it on and have a discussion at the end of the talk. So thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, Constantine. Uh, the floor is yours. Super. Uh, thank you, Francesco, for the kind introduction and invitation to present here. Um, Francesco just mentioned, uh, but let me also add this disclaimer here. I'm a data scientist, not a legal expert. Um, we will cover some specifics of uh, Swiss legislation in this talk. And to the best of my knowledge, this is correct. But if you really want to have a, a pinpoint the legal advice, then please approach your data protection officers, etc., in your institution. And uh, since this is a worldwide event, um, everything I say has the focus on Switzerland. Other countries might have similar or completely other regulations. Um, yeah, but I hope you find it interesting nevertheless. So um, now the next slide does not work. It's this, okay. Briefly, what are we going to talk about? Um, want to discuss with you, why are we even thinking about open data and sharing clinical data? We will discuss the fair data principle. It will be a very short discourse into uh, good clinical practice and what this means for data management. Then the legal and ethical limitations that I already uh, mentioned on the previous slide. And then we will look into two possibilities in making clinical data accessible for other researchers, namely via anonymization of data and with a data access committee. So let's dive into the introduction and uh, briefly discuss, uh, well, let's, let's start at the beginning, what is open data? So if I'm starting from scratch, I very often just open Wikipedia. And what does Wikipedia say to the topic is, uh, well, open data is data that is uh, licensed under an open license. Well, it does not have that much. Let's look what is an open license. So basically, uh, this means that any other person is allowed to do whatever they want with the data. So open data is uh, yeah, openly accessible. It can be edited. It can be shared for anyone for any purpose. Um, you might already think that uh, this definition of open data will be difficult for clinical or, or research data. Think about edit table and so on. Yeah, we will going to discuss this. 
Why is open research data important? There is a nice statement uh, published from the Concord data and open research data, and we will come back to this later, that uh, nicely defines here that the research data um, is the evidence that goes along with your research results. And it's necessary to validate the findings of uh, your research. And also the Swiss National Science Foundation has a statement on uh, data sharing and say that, yes, uh, it's important for the transparency, for the reproducibility of research, and that research data should be shared as openly as possible. So we already see here uh, openly as possible. So there's already a hint of there might be some limitations. And specific to clinical data, why should clinical data be shared? Let's look into two uh, statements here. The first is from the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, who already published in 2017 that they believe it's an ethical obligation to share data that's uh, been collected in intervention and clinical trials because the trial participants put themselves at risk. They agreed that there's some uh, experimental intervention that's been conducted, and therefore you should really uh, take into account what uh, they agreed to and uh, use the data to get the most benefit out of it. And also the World Health Organization states that uh, for clinical trials, data sharing is one of three pillars that account for best practice for clinical trials. So um, by the way, don't know how much you know about clinical uh, research. Um, one of the things for clinical research is that uh, typically you should, uh, especially for clinical trials, you're actually required to uh, pre-register um, your study in an online database. And uh, in addition to this, it's also um, suggested by the World Health Organization to share data as uh, best practice. So, and now from a more from, from technical side, why, why bother? What can you do with the shared clinical data? Well, once the data is shared for, to other researchers, uh, they can, for example, look into a new question that looks into a subset of the original data. You can apply new analysis techniques. Um, but for example, you can also start and um, combine individual patient data from multiple data sets that you uh, get access to. And then instead of making a meta-analysis uh, based on summary statistics, you can really work with individual patient data and that can allow to answer new questions or can allow to make more precise estimates. And then of course, what's always an issue with open data is the question of reproducibility of results. And there, as we've seen, uh, open data is really considered to be um, necessary for full reproducibility of research results. What are the requirements? So this uh, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, uh, they stated that starting from uh, 2019, now every clinical trial that uh, wants to publish in one of the journals needs to include a data sharing uh, statement. And uh, it already should include a data sharing plan in the trial registration. So what I mentioned before, this is the pre-registration. And one web page where uh, most of clinical trials, to my knowledge, are published is uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And they have an optional module for individual patient data sharing, where you can answer um, what data will be shared, at what time frame, are there any access criteria, and yeah, what, what other information uh, is relevant for this sharing statement. Also funders, uh, Horizon Europe, for example, demands that uh, data is uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, so FAIR. And we will discuss later, later um, what this means exactly. And uh, here we also see for the first time this uh, making data as open as possible, but at the same time uh, as close as necessary to uh, safeguard ethical and, and uh, legal limitations. 
and also the Swiss National Science Foundation. I think I mentioned this uh, now expects that uh, data is made uh, available, but also here uh, they acknowledge that there might be some limitations to this. But what they expect is that uh, at least the data underlying a publication should be shared so to make the results reproducible with so at the same time with the publication and uh, that the fair data principles uh, should be uh, adhered and everything regarding to data sharing resources uh, and reuse uh, should be described in the data management plan and here you can see an expert of the policy on open research data and here again we see that uh, also here, SNSF acknowledges that, uh, yes, so please share data, um, but in, there are certain limitations, legal, ethical, copyright, or similar clauses that might prevent you from going full open data. Um, but uh, at least the, the metadata is already written here, um, should be publicly available. So, Again, this is not specific for Switzerland for the SNSF, um, but a data management plan is uh, something that is similarly structured. So Horizon Europe has a different structure, um, but the details are the same. So basically a data management plan contains information on uh, what data is collected, how is it collected, how is the data structured and documented information about the legal and ethical questions that arise with the research project and specific with the data storage, for example, and data protection and security, and how you plan to preserve the data. And this is the important aspect here that goes with the open data, how data sharing and reuse in plant. And the nice thing is for uh, clinical research, that uh, the first three points are more or less covered already in the clinical study protocol, which uh, you anyways have to prepare and submit to the ethics uh, committee. So what's really new here in the data management plan is that you have to also describe the data sharing and reuse. So in detail, what's new, so new with respect to the study protocol is, well, there's this issue about the fair data principles. So you should also think about the data format and the metadata. Um, something that's typically not specifically addressed in the study protocol is uh, the responsibility as data controller. Data controller is the person that uh, in the end has the uh, legal responsibility for yeah, data protection, what's happening with the data and so on. This is typically the sponsor's institution. So for example, in my case, it would be the University Hospital Basel if I would conduct a clinical study here. Other information is uh, what, what will you do with the data when your project uh, terminates? So which data will be retained, which will be shared, and which will be anonymized or deleted? And the questions regarding the data sharing, how and where will the data be shared? And these are really now the questions as they are written in the web form of the SNSF. So I, I probably don't have to go into the details here. But these are the questions that uh, any data management plan uh, should cover. So let me briefly also discuss this concordant on open research data. And this was a memorandum of understanding that originally was uh, uh, agreed upon members from the United Kingdom research community. But it's, it's a really nice uh, document. And they define 10 principles as best practice for, for research data. And I think it really summarizes here the, the important points that uh, data research data should be made pos uh, open wherever it is possible. But they acknowledge that there might be uh, legal or ethical limitations. And, and that's something that I think is also very important. They acknowledge that this, so making research data open and sharing data and fair data principles on comes with certain costs. And this needs to be acknowledged by the funding agencies, for example, which is exactly what also Horizon Europe and SNF are doing. Um, I'm not reading through these slides, um, 
I just have them here for, for full completion. So um, I don't know, I don't see any questions. So I would suggest I move on and we take a look at the FAIR data principles. The FAIR data principles uh, is summarized here. So FAIR stands, I mentioned it before, for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And uh, exactly that's the order that uh, the data has to undergo. So in order to um, yeah, in order to start working with data, you have to find it, right? And uh, in order to find out if it's interoperable, you first need to have access to it and so on. So what's important here is fair data and open data are not the same. This is fair data is really an approach that you should adhere to already when you collect data, or maybe even better when you start planning to collect data. And it doesn't really matter if you make the data open later on or not, because it's something that uh, you benefit uh, yourself if your data is fair, because uh, you will have a better understanding of your data. So let's look into these four um, principles in detail. What does it mean to make data findable? Well, it means that uh, there is a it's nicely written here, a global and unique and eternal persistent identifier. So it's a global ID, uh, like a digital object identifier, a DOE, uh, that's uh, assigned to your data. And this ID is indexed in a, yeah, in a repository, basically. And that way, you can link your metadata and your data via this uh, unique global ID. And that already increases the visibility of your research results. So you can imagine that there is a search index, a, a repository, and you search for your publication, and then you can find already, aha, there is uh, research data, and uh, that can lead to higher impact, uh, more citations potentially, and increase collaboration because people realize, aha, so the data uh, can be reused, for example. So once you find the data, uh, it should be accessible. Um, so if it's open data, then the, the data should be published. But if it's not open data, then at least the metadata uh, should be published. And it should be described how uh, using this global identifier how one can retrieve the metadata and the access to at least this metadata should be open and uh, without any charge and universally implementable. So basically all these uh, research data catalogs on the, on the internet, on the web, uh, adhere to this accessible um, structure. Here. If necessary, so you doesn't have to be open data. If necessary, the access to the data themselves can be restricted. And may, potentially the data is also removed after a certain time. But uh, the metadata should really persist uh, yeah, forever, even if the data are no longer available. Interoperable, the next uh, data fair principle, um, means that uh, yeah, it's always written here semi-automatically. Uh, it should be easy to combine data with other sources, uh, meaning that uh, you use a data format that it's widely access, um, accepted. The, you use a metadata of a, a standard um, using an open format, for example, so no proprietary uh, data software. You use certain concepts and vocabularies um, that are easy to interpret for um, for a user. And finally, re reusable. And here, we really, this is the, the, the last uh, pillar here. And basically, this says that, uh, yeah, how do you guarantee that a user knows uh, what your data actually represents? Because if you just see a variable name, you really don't really know what's behind it. So metadata is the data um, that uh, you now use to guarantee that uh, third party researcher knows what's going on here. And you can distinguish between a very generic set of metadata, which is who, what, when, and how. So that's, that's just a global identifier for the data set. 
and project specific data and that's really everything from the laboratory conditions uh, to norm values uh, the the code book for example any specifics about the software you were using uh, study protocol so for example imagine if you just see a variable that says blood pressure uh, it can be very important to know whether the blood pressure was measured uh, after a period of resting or after a period of uh, an intense workout. So this is uh, really what a user or a researcher needs to know in order to get uh, the correct conclusions from the data. Yeah, and all these metadata should follow a domain relevant community standard. Um, I don't know, is there a question here in the chat? Um, no, sorry, it's no question. Feel free to answer uh, to to ask a question. By the way, I have a look a little bit. And now I have to click here. Okay, so this brings me to a really brief uh, introduction to uh, good clinical practice and to the to the data management aspects of good clinical practice. So. Uh, for those of you who don't know what good clinical practice is, it's also uh, some just abbreviated as GCP. This is a guideline from the International Council for Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Registration of Pharmaceutical for Human Use. Wow, that's a long title. Uh, so it's in, in short, just ICH. Um, this is an international data quality, uh, not only data quality, an international quality standard uh, a guideline for uh, safeguarding uh, patient safety and their personal rights. And uh, basically, because if you make a full clinical trial, where, as I mentioned, uh, participants put themselves at risk, and then you lose the data or you alter the data or something happens uh, that would undermine the whole um, ethics of a, of a trial, that's why the good clinical practice guideline also includes statements on uh, data management. And in an addendum, it also um, acknowledged that there are, we're living in an age of digitalization. So there were additional categories added for electronic data recording. And what's interesting here is that um, GCP, this is really just a guideline, a recommendation. But in fact, um, by the Swiss regulations for clinical research, it uh, becomes uh, mandatory. It's basically implemented in the law, at least for clinical trials, and it's similar for the European Medical Agency and so on. So um, it's not just some recommendation that you should follow, but in a lot of cases, it's uh, uh, you have to follow it by law. And what does it say about data management? So for example, it says that uh, if you're working with a computerized system for data capture, for data analysis, you need to make sure that uh, this is validated. And this means that uh, you ensure that uh, the system is accurate, reliable, has a consistent performance. And uh, if you know about the system validation, everything that you do also needs to be documented. Basically, if you don't write it down, it did not happen. Um, it also means that you have a set up a list of standards of procedures that tell you how your computer systems are installed, um, how they are updated, how they have been tested, uh, data security, uh, backups, and so on. And uh, it's also important is that uh, there should be um, the data, in data integrity needs to be guaranteed when you update the data. So it cannot happen that you update uh, your system and suddenly data is lost. So typically this is something that your institution will provide for. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about it, but that only uh, that's only true if you really uh, ask them and, and work with software that's provided for them for the specific purpose. So if you just take out the spreadsheet application and uh, start working on your personal desktop, then probably you won't have the correct uh, documentation and backup and so on. If you're working in such an electronic data system, 
any change that you do must be recorded in an audit trail. That means the data cannot be deleted. It's always traceable what changes have been performed. You must prevent unauthorized access. So there's, there's some sort of um, users with, with uh, user access with passwords. And GCP also demands that uh, you plan the data, the data handling already in advance. Again, similar to the data management plan. Um, what data are you going to collect? Where is it stored? And how do you protect this data? So, uh -huh. okay, thank you, Xeni. Yeah, so let's move on and uh, look at legal and ethical limitations. And again, I mentioned it before, now this is very specific to Switzerland. And every time I open Zoom here, something I need to click here. So yeah, basic question, but why should you even think about data protection at all? Well, it's easy to answer. Um, this is uh, written down uh, prominently in the Swiss federal constitution in the article of the right to privacy. And similarly, also the Charter of the Fundamental Rights of the European Union has a statement that uh, everybody has the right that the personal data is protected. So data protection is a fundamental right and uh, we should uh, adhere to it. That's also clearly again stated here in the Swiss uh, Federal Data Protection Act. Uh, now something specific to Switzerland here, I will discuss only the Federal Data Protection Act, uh, but please keep in mind, for example, here for the University Hospital Basel, it's actually the, the data protection legislation from the canton of Basel that, um, that has to be uh, followed. So they are similar, but they are not really identically. So uh, yeah, have a look at that if it really matters. For a lot of cases, uh, it won't really matter that there are slight differences here. Also, the General Data Protection Regulation of the European Union uh, states that uh, yeah, it's really about the fundamental rights and freedoms of persons that the data must be protected. Now, this, the Data Protection Act also specifies uh, what are sensitive data. So sensitive data is data that requires uh, additional um, concern when protecting. And here you can see that the health, genetic data, and biometric data are types of data that are sensitive and that uh, require more protection than, uh, yeah, than for example, uh, uh, just a general personal data, like, a, a, I don't know, telephone number maybe. Let's look at the Swiss Human Research Act. And uh, I just want to highlight here two articles. Uh, one is the article number five, and it says that the research involving human beings, so clinical research, may only be conducted if it addresses a topic of scientific relevance. And article 10, which basically says that, yeah, the good uh, clinical practice uh, has to be uh, followed and they must make sure that everybody working uh, on this project has appropriate qualifications and so on. And what's important to notice here that if you just hand out the data from your clinical research and make it open data, uh, you have no control anymore. So in theory, people could address any topic without scientific relevance and you don't know what are the qualifications and what they're going to do. So we already see here that these two articles basically are uh, a limitation to sharing clinical data openly. And now we're not even talking about the data protection here. This is really just following from these two articles. Another thing is that uh, the Human Research Act uh, requires that persons may only be involved in a research project if they've given their informed consent. And if you plan to make further use, so if you plan to share your data, uh, then you also need to get the consent that uh, you can later reuse the data for other research projects. So 
there are certain exceptions. So in, in, in given certain conditions are met, the Responsible Ethics Committee may approve that uh, you can have a further use of uh, research project without consent, but uh, this should really be the ex um, exception. Um, so um, please try it and, and get the informed consent of every subject that you can that you can find. Yes, and that basically here is then the question of uh, further use of data. And uh, this is just in a nutshell that also the further use of data requires that uh, the persons which are concerned have given the consent or at least not uh, did not dissent. And what I aim for is here, this statement here. So if you look at uh, one of the ordinances associated with the Human Research Act, you find that uh, making accessible or available or transferring of uh, clinical data is a further use. And as we have seen, a further use also requires uh, a approval of an ethics committee and it requires an, some sort of consent. So we have here this challenge um, that uh, clinical data must uh, be used for specific risk question and only after approval by a responsible ethics committee. And therefore, the Human Research Act is an ethical and legal limitation for clinical open research data. Okay. Can have a look also on the later in the Human Research Act. You can also read that, uh, yeah, there is even potential uh, prison sentence or uh, monetary penalty. And so if you uh, violate and uh, conduct a research project without authorization. So how can we proceed? How can we make sure? Because uh, after, in the, after the introduction, I hope you were all motivated that uh, open data is the way to go. So yes, there are two possible solutions how we can share clinical data in accordance with the Human Research Act. That can be anonymization of data or sharing data via data access committee uh, provided that the data transfer and usage agreement is signed. Okay, let's look into these two options in detail. Let's start with anonymization. Something that always troubles a lot of people is uh, the difference between pseudonymization and anonymization. That's why I want to uh, include this here explicitly. So pseudonymized data, and I write the coded data because in the Human Research Act, pseudonymized data is uh, labeled coded data, um, means that uh, you remove direct identifiers like name, address, and so on. You store them separately in a screening or enrollment log, so it's separated away from the clinical data. And then your uh, patients uh, are linked via a participant ID or patient ID, uh, to the identifying data in this list. So your actual research data only contains this participant ID, but no direct identifiers. And what's very important is that uh, this data remains identifiable and it remains personal data. And the contrast of pseudonymized data is anonymized data. The definition of anonymization is that a re-identification of the patient is only possible with disproportionate effort. So why in pseudonymized data, I can just go open my enrollment log and look up the um, corresponding data with the participant ID for anonymized data. This is not possible or only possible with disproportionate effort. But once you succeed in this and the data are anonymized, they are out of scope from Human Research Act and the Data Protection Act. And uh, yeah, thereby you could make the data open. But what's important to notice here, what means disproportionate effort? And this is uh, identically in the European Union and also in Switzerland. There's no rigid definition of anonymization. Um, it's a risk-based approach and it's up to you, the researchers, to assess and mitigate the risk of re-identification and uh, make sure that uh, such a re-identification is only possible with disproportionate effort. So I mentioned already two types of identifiers. Um, just briefly, uh, you can think of direct identifiers that are 
immediately, directly related to a specific person, like names or addresses, social security number, and so on. Um, also full face photographs and so on. And basically this type of data needs to be removed. The more problematic, uh, because they are typically also interesting for the research, uh, are the quasi or indirect identifiers. And these are data variables that can be linked to other data sources, maybe alone, maybe in combination, and then they allow for a re-identification. And that can be, for example, some rare diseases or treatments, or basically any data that is uh, of high precise information that could potentially be used for, for a linkage, or a combination. So any uh, uncommon combination of variables that pinpoints uh, uh, to a certain patient. And this type of indirect identifiers needs then to be transformed in order to mitigate this risk of re-identification. Why is this important? And I'd like to show you this with an example of so-called linkage attacks. So this is a story um, from 1997 where Professor Latania Svine was able, as part of her PhD thesis, to uh, re-identify the governor of uh, Massachusetts by taking um, data that was considered to be anonymized at that time from a, a hospital and linking it with the publicly available uh, voter registration list of Cambridge. And uh, simply by looking at the combination of zip code, birth date, and sex, she was able to re-identify the governor in this uh, hospital data. And yeah, this should show you that what used to be defined as anonymized uh, in, the, in the last century is no longer considered state of the art. And this should also illustrate why simply removing uh, certain identifiers like name and address and so on is not enough to make data anonymized because you can always use some indirect identifiers like sex and zip code and birth date, for example, to re-identify a person. So what's the correct way to do it, the, the modern way to anonymize? And you can look here at two different type of risks. And one risk you should consider is the context risk, and that is the probability of an attack. And the other risk is the data risk. And this is given that there is an attack, how, what's the probability of uh, a re-identification within the data? We will have a brief look at both these, con uh, both these risks in the next slides. But basically, the idea is here that it's a balance. If you have a high context risk, then you need to make sure that the data risk is very small. If, on the other hand, you have a very small context risk, so very small uh, probability of an attack, then uh, potentially the data risk can be higher. How low? The risk should go is something you should discuss with a legal expert, uh, a statistician, a data analyst, and, and potentially you as the, the domain expert in this uh, clinical field. And then you should mitigate this risk. Let's look at the context risk here. And here we see on the right hand side a scale of uh, making data public. And I've already shown you three types. So one is the open data where you have zero control. You just put up the data uh, somewhere. The other way is you really have the full access, uh, full control with you because the data is locked away in, in a vault in your basement or in between where you share data with a um, data transfer usage agreement. Uh, and basically, how where you place yourself on this scale gives you more control and more trustworthiness. And this is a really, really efficient way of uh, reducing the um, context risk. Other question you should ask is if you're working with highly sensitive data that potentially would stigmatize a, a patient, um, you should potentially give that a higher uh, risk. And yeah, what are, what are motivations uh, of an attacker? Again, if you make data open, you should always consider the worst case. 
but uh, if you ask a data recipient to sign a usage agreement, um, it might be sufficient to assume that, well, they have uh, knowledge and they, they are willing to make inquiries, but they will not resort to criminality. So this is really a way to mitigate the context risk by uh, considering these three questions. And if we look at the data, questions that we should ask is, uh, how consistently is a variable related to a specific person? So laboratory values, if you measure my blood pressure today and then tomorrow and so on, there will be a certain variation, right? Um, but demographics remain the same. So demographics have a high replicability. Potentially, uh, it's easier to re-identify a person with the demographics and laboratory values have a low data source availability. So think of this uh, Cambridge voter registration list, what external data sources are available for making a linkage attack? How many persons share a specific combination of identifiers? So as you've seen, uh, date of birth and zip code uh, have a very high distinguishability, whereas if you just take a look at the canton at the year of birth, it's uh, alone. And this is also something to consider, but um, structured data has a, a smaller risk than free text, where potentially is even more identifying data inside. Is it aggregated data and so on? Typically, uh, I used to be bothered about uh, unique records in my data set, but actually unique records are only really a problem if you know about if you know a mechanism that can make sure that this can be exploited. So um, instead of worrying too much about unique records, it's really about thinking about which identifiers can be used in a linkage attack and how an attacker could use unique combinations to re-identify a patient. And then it's important to keep in mind, you can then actually uh, calculate the uh, probability of uh, an identification given that is an attack, this condition probability will be always by definition non-zero. So you should think about the threshold and uh, then apply data transformations to mitigate this risk. So I'm running out of time and I'm not going to show you all these different transformation methods in detail. Uh, think about it that you can uh, remove columns if you don't need it. Uh, you can aggregate data, you should shift dates. What's important is whatever you do, you really need to uh, document all the transformations. These are uh, even more complicated ways of transforming the data, um, applying some random noise, uh, forming groups, and then replacing values with a group mean, uh, permutating and adding a specific uncertainty again. But what's important here is that whatever you do, you will have an impact on your data utility. And basically you start to uh, putting the replicability of your results at risk. And that's contrary to the principles of open data. So what you can do is if you start uh, anonymizing the data and once you reach the point where you think um, the data risk is small enough, you can check whether it's a valid data set. Uh, ideally, then you check uh, whether you can reproduce your uh, results from your original data with the anonymized data. And then you check whether for a specific research project, this data and the information loss that you induced is acceptable. And everything you do needs to be documented, of course. But there is another option which uh, has no impact on information loss, and this is uh, sharing data within data access committee. And remember here, what did the concordat on open research data say? So any restriction that you have on making data publicly available needs to be justified and justifiable. But data protection of uh, health data is a reasonable justification. So think about the statement, sharing data as open as possible and as close as necessary. And this is where data access committee or a DAC uh, comes into play with a data transfer and usage agreement. So what does a data access committee do? 
basically it uh, allows other researchers access to the data, but it does not publish the data themselves. It uh, only publishes metadata. And this ensures a balance between open data and data protection. So the sensitive data actually remains locked away. The metadata is uh, publicly findable, it's accessible, so researchers can find the data. And then they can submit a proposal to the data access committee where they describe that uh, research proposal they want to do. The data access committee will uh, evaluate this. The data access committee will check whether, and for example, an approval from the ethics committee is obtained. And then it will require that uh, data recipient signs a data transfer and usage agreement. And only if all of these conditions are met, the data will be shared with the requester. The advantage is, for example, that while anonymized data by definition will make it impossible to merge different data sets, you can think of uh, multiple studies that share the data by the same data access committee. In theory, you could then ask the data access committee to merge this data and make it available, and then a new data set can be analyzed. So it's uh, thinking of this interoperability of FAIR, it's an advantage you can only have with data access committee. The data transfer and usage agreement in the end, this is a contract between the data controller and the requester that defines that the data is only used for this single research project. That there will be no attempts to re-identify patients, that uh, good research practices followed, and uh, yeah, you can also uh, put in there that the proper scientific credit of the authors for the original data set uh, is followed. Yeah, what's important here to note is that the data controller does not own the data. That's a term you previously read a lot, um, but the data controller, I think I mentioned this already, is uh, the person that really is responsible for the data governance. Yeah. And as mentioned before, a data transfer and usage agreement reduces this uh, context risk, so the probability of re-identification attempts, and thereby it enables a higher disclosure risk in the for a higher data risk, basically, in the data center receiver. Okay, so I think that's the final question is now where to publish the metadata if you want to work with the data access committee. Remember here, findable, interoperable, uh, that you need a DOI, uh, you should have a rich uh, metadata. And uh, so the data access committee of the medical faculty of the University of Basel uses a web page, um, a, a community on Zenodo, that's a, a repository uh, of CERN. The Swiss Personal Health Network uh, Court Consortium has a sp specific for cohorts, the Maelstrom catalog, Basically, what's important is that uh, you have an interoperable format and uh, that uh, it's clear how uh, whom to contact to get access to the data. Okay, with this, I will come to the summary. Um, keep in mind, so the, the life cycle of a, a research uh, project, uh, when you plan, describe the data handling in the study protocol, write a data management plan and budget the costs for data sharing and for data management. GCP requires that your computer systems are validated. Uh, you should have fair principles already implemented for the data collections. You should remember you need informed consent not only for the participating in the clinical research project, but also if you plan to share the data. So make sure that this is part of your consent form that the patient sign. Um, yeah, then when you start performing your research project, collect the data in a fair way. And then follow this principle of sharing your data as open as possible, um, but as close as necessary. So for example, um, use a data access committee when the data transfer and usage agreement. Yeah. Um, I think uh, with this open research data um, in clinical research, I hope makes more sense to you. Yeah, and uh, I think we are a little bit over the time.
So let's see if you have any questions. Thank you.